I'm Christina Foxley, Director of Events, and I'm pleased to welcome Tim Kreider, here tonight to share images from his new book, Twilight of the Assholes. Kreider mocks not only the evil and hapless Bush, but the fecklessness of progressives, the imbecile bigotry of radical Islam, and most of all, the dumb bovine complacency of the American voter. Twilight of the Assholes is a historical chronicle of the end of the era of darkness and, believe it or not, a heartening document of one man's loss and tentative restoration of faith in democracy. Following his presentation, Tim will take your questions. I'll walk around with a wireless microphone, so please wait for that before you speak. And then he'll stick around to sign his book, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming Tim Kreider to The Strand. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess that's better. Um, just as a little prologue, um, I'd like to ask you to travel with me back to election night 2004. This won't be very pleasant, but it will be brief. Um, so, my cartoon is due Monday morning at the latest. Election night is, of course, Tuesday. The cartoon doesn't show up in print until Wednesday. What do I do? Well, what I decided to do is to hedge my bets. Uh, I drew three panels, each one illustrating my reaction to each of the different possible scenarios. There's the red state victory. Here we see me fleeing the country, apparently in some haste. That's my beloved cat in the valise. <laughs> There's the blue state victory. Here we're reenacting the VE Day photo from Times Square. That's me and my friend Jim, uh, who you'll see more of later. Uh, and then, of course, there's what seemed um, appallingly like a, a perfectly plausible scenario in light of the previous ev elections events, another recount. This is a little complicated. What, what's going on there is that I have a diving suit which is filled with whiskey. I'm breathing whiskey, and ingeniously I'm operating a flamethrower which is fueled by whiskey fumes. Um, okay, so I guess I can't really build up a whole lot of suspense here since we know how this turned out. That's the cartoon I drew the following week. Uh, I don't... I, I guess I know we... we if you're here in this room, you probably felt about the same way I did. I mean, we were all um, sort of incredulous and horrified in 2000 when the Supreme Court just plain stole the election. But uh, I at least found it way more demoralizing when the Bush administration seemingly legitimately won the election in, in 2004. I mean, even if you think there was some tomfoolery at the polls, it's still depressing that it was close enough to steal. Um, it's not like there's anything we didn't know in 2004 about Bush and company that we found out later. Um, it was already clearly a, a, an incompetent and criminal disastrous administration, and a slim majority of my fellow Americans said, yes, more of this guy. Um, and at that point, I went around some sort of psychic bend and stopped thinking of those people as ignorant or misguided and started thinking of them as something a little more like evil. Um, so what happens at that point to you as a, as a um, human being and a citizen and an artist if, say, you spent the last four years drawing political cartoons and now lost all faith in uh, governance and democracy and your fellow man? Well, that will be interesting to see. Uh, that's what's collected in this volume, Twilight of the Assholes. Um, I'm not going to read a lot from the text in this book, but there are one or two passages I want to read. Um, this one, just in case you've forgotten what it was like, is from the afterword. It's easy to forget now how this country felt during the build-up to the Iraq invasion or after the 2004 election. Invincible stupidity triumphant, all intelligent debate suspect and unpatriotic, dissent and compassion discarded as peacetime luxuries. Objective reality itself, a naive, obsolete standard. Holding my work up to persnickety literary standards now is a little like holding a man accountable for what he screams while he's being tortured. We were ignored and kept helpless while hateful people did ghastly things in our name. It felt like being held down and spit on by the playground bully for eight years. Well, 
that bit about the torture is a little disingenuous. I mean, most people who've been tortured don't then voluntarily publish the transcripts of their interviews, which is effectively what I've done here. Um, but the analogy is apt in that this, is, this book doesn't purport to be any kind of political analysis. I know as little or even less than you do about the news. Um, what it is is a document of what it felt like to be an American in what turns out to have been a, a crucial decade, the one where we went into our terminal decline. Um, and what I think you'll see happen to me, and what I found looking back on these cartoons, is that I vacillated wildly between um, unabashed bitterness and contempt for my fellow Americans and increasingly desperate efforts to find something funny in all that. And the more atrocious and bleak things got, the more um, inappropriate and antic and demented the humor became. Examples to follow. So my first reaction, um, backlash, rage. Now is the time. Suddenly and without warning, we must preemptively launch the Civil War II. Why? Well, the South is a geographically and ethnically distinct region with its own history, culture, dialect, and customs, most of whose core beliefs are fundamentally incompatible with America's. The fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Our strategy? Step one. Clone William Tecumseh Sherman. If cloning proves impractical, retrieve General Sherman using time travel. Step two, introduce him to nuclear weapons. Boys, I was wrong when I said war is hell. We just wasn't doing it right. This is fucking beautiful. That's Dallas. Instead of a solemn surrender at Appomattox, victory will be celebrated by President Winfrey wiping her ass with the Confederate flag. And if any of you crackers don't like it, y'all can just kiss my big black hiney. Woo! Wipe it good, sister. You go, girl. <laughs> Inevitably, there will be some upheavals of the social order. Fetch me another Hennessy, Bubba. Yes, Massa. What's that, boy? Yes, uh, Massa. I think I'm not the only one who kind of mentally seceded after the 2004 election. Um, my whole official policy toward the Bush agenda, the war in Iraq, effectively became... Okay, well, good luck with that. Why don't you let us know how that works out for you? Not a very healthy attitude for a functioning democracy. Um, some of my friends, even colleagues, and a lot of readers pointed out to me that my representations of our brethren back in, in the heartland, as they like to call it, were maybe a little unflattering and unfair and caricaturish. Um, all I can say is, I, I don't make this shit up. Um, I mean, I lived in rural Maryland for a very long time. I still have a cabin there. Um, I use photo references. I mean, look at this. That's an illustration. That's a photo from uh, a local newspaper called The Bar Hopper. Uh, these are real people. Uh, th th this is from an um, event called the Southern Rock Woodstock. I mean, look at that guy. You tell me. Which one's the caricature? <laughs> a problem with this guy is, unfortunately, try as you might, you really can't hate him. Um, I mean, he and I, I think, have the same fundamental goals in life, which are, are just to be fucked up as much as possible. He's kind of a lovable doofus. Not so this lady. I just did a Google image search on the phrase Republican ladies. <laughs> this woman belongs to something called the Purdue Tea Group. Um, and the thing this made me think of instantly was, Fr was Francisco Goya's portrait of, of the family of Charles IV, a bunch of piggy-faced inbred morons. <laughs> I mean, this was the whole problem with trying to be a caricaturist, just staying ahead of the absurdity curve. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people developed their private crackpot theories about the cultural divide. I mean, they seemed not just like ideologically different, but neurologically, genetically different, like Morlocks and Eloy. My, my personal crackpot theory was this. Conservatives, basically pro-death. Liberals, basically pro-sex. And I, I, you, I know actually what you're thinking was, what about the whole pro-life thing? That's not pro-death. No, that's only incidentally pro-life. What it is is fundamentally anti-sex. And I thought, how is it even possible these people have ever won an election in a country as notoriously sex-obsessed as the United States. And that's where I came up with my new platform. It's now obvious to all but the Democrats that the Democratic Party is moribund. The time has come for them to reinvent themselves as the sex party, their motto. Are you getting enough? 
symbol of the Republican Party, the elephant, symbol of the sex party, the ass. <laughs> Here's some sex party paraphernalia. I fuck and I vote. Republicans always come first. Clinton fucked in the White House. Bush just lies there. Jesus loved the horse. That's my, my friend Jim, the one you saw me kissing earlier. He likes to yell this out of car windows. Jesus loved the horse. Um, he wants to get bumper stickers made. When people challenge him on this, he's like, read the fucking Bible. He did. Jesus loved the horse. Confronted with charges of sexual impropriety, the sex party candidate responds, yes, I fucked that woman. I fucked her from hell to breakfast. I fucked her like I was Paul Bunyan, and she was a flapjack the size of Lake Tahoe. I intend to fuck her immediately after this press conference. Next question. <laughs> Here we see the way in which the Republican Party has traditionally fucked the poor, but look how the sex party fucks the poor. I'm a terrible person, I know that. <clears throat> I have relatives in the audience right now. It's very embarrassing. Um... I think a lot of the reason for my personal rancor and loathing of these people, um, the thing I'm still unable to forgive them for, was the Iraq War. Um, I did what I felt were my best cartoons about this. Like in 2003, um, unfortunately, despite my brilliant cartoons, the fucking war kept going on. Uh, and I, I kept having to do cartoons about it. It would have been too frivolous not to. Um, my new Iraq policy. What's your Iraq strategy? Why we lost in Iraq? I couldn't stop. Um, this is perhaps the, the least funny and best cartoon I ever did about it. I drew this simply because there was a piece of information that I had never seen graphically represented anywhere. And eventually, I could no longer bear not having seen it and was forced to draw it myself. And this was simply a comparison between the casualties we suffered in this country on 9-11 and the casualties we subsequently inflicted in reprisal in Iraq. I didn't even count Afghanistan. Um, this involved me doing math, for which I expect some appreciation. Uh, I decided to use the Twin Towers as a unit of measure in graphically representing this. That represents the 3,000 3, people killed in the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Um, this would be the civilian casualties in Iraq. As I first calculated that and then realized my math was off, and no, actually, it was rather more even than that. Red Cross estimates 150,000 people killed in Iraq. Oh, and there's, there's Bush and uh, John McCain at the bottom. Yeah, not quite. Let's say we give him five for flinching. Somewhere in the second term of the Bush administration, even conservatives started getting worried about the war in Iraq because it was costing so much. Obviously, I'm not referring to the human cost. I mean, you know, the bottom line. Um, you notice when we liberals float our pie-in-the-sky initiatives about education and the environment, conservatives are always like, well, where's that money going to come from? Who's going to pay for that? It doesn't grow on trees, you know. They never raise this objection when, when the whole plan is to kill people on the other side of the planet. Pro-death. You mark my words. Um, when that issue started getting more press, I drew a much funnier cartoon. Just think what we could have done with the money we spent on Iraq. Moved all Americans under the sea. I will decide when it is safe to return to the surface world. Meantime, let us enjoy our new lives beneath the waves. Oh, but look who it is, our old nemesis, the terrorists. I, this is actually accurate. I did some calculations yet again. People don't realize how much math is involved in being a cartoonist. One flat screen HD TV for every individual American, or your choice, one hot tub for every family. Of course, we could have just given it all to Saddam Hussein in exchange for stepping down. Ah, Anna, Anna, my life until now was squandered in the vain pursuit of power. We have each other, Saddam, that's all that matters. That's Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> I, I drew her kind of at random in this cartoon.